I'm Charles, and I'm on a mission to find what's inside everything. To help me get my answers, I have an industrial CT scanner. It takes a whole bunch of x-ray images from all around a subject, and then builds a 3D model revealing every internal detail. The 2000's called, and they want their phone back. But that's too bad, because I'm going to CT scan it and show you what's inside. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, call, you, I'll call you back later. We're just about to do something. Okay, bye. This is Nokia's foldable follow-up to their famously fortified phone. It's the Nokia 3351i. And while it's not the 3310 of Legends, it's still a pretty chalky little beast. So why don't we have personal electronics that are this robust? Why don't we make them like this anymore? And what's it like on the inside? Let's find out. Here we have our scan of our Nokia 3155i. And we're getting pretty good clarity on this. We can see everything best I can tell. First things first, let's talk about one of the iconic features of the flip phone. That is the extendable antenna. How is this constructed so that the antenna actually can move in and out and work in both the fully extended and fully collapsed positions? So here we have an increased region of interest, or ROI, focused in on the antenna. And we can see actually the whole structure of it. The antenna is literally just a wire with a ferrule on each end, which you probably could have guessed just by looking at it. What's kind of unexpected is that there's actually an electrical contact deep within the phone that will make a connection to the back end of the antenna cable when it's all the way inserted. Now, what actually is that doing there? I think all that's there for is just to go click on this little lump. And that's there just that this remains in the fully closed position and gives a nice satisfying when you close it. If we carry on down along the length of the antenna, we'll find that there's this other ferrule at the top of the phone. And this is what forms the little tube that the antenna comes out of. That ferrule also has an electrical connection going to it from the main board of the phone. So if I'm understanding this right, the way this works is that all of the electrical connection for the antenna itself is actually up in this top end. It's really just this one leaf contact on the main circuit board going to that antenna. So here's how this all comes together. When this is fully extended out, then this crimped nubbin at the end of the wire is going to actually wind up jammed into this tube on the front of the phone. That's going to make an electrical connection between this wire and this antenna housing, and that's going to give you the full signal strength because you have, well, the full length antenna sticking out outside of the phone. When this is collapsed all the way, however, all this is going to do is click against this spring. And that spring is just there to retain this antenna in place. I don't believe there's any electrical connection to the board actually being made there. However, at the front, this ferrule is going to touch that sleeve. And that means we now have the same length of antenna, just in a worse position, operating inside of the phone. And that's kind of the whole reason they had the adjustable antennas, is because out here, you have an antenna operating in free air, far away from, say, the user's head. Whereas when it's down in here, it's kind of inside of a piece of electronics, and that tends to hamper the performance of a radio. That's one mystery sorted out. Let's talk about the general physical construction of this unit. Basically, why are these things so chunky? This may not be like the most robust phone ever, and the hinges on these things did often fail, but the rest of the body could kind of keep going forever. And why was that? Curiously, the first thing that kind of stands out in this is that there's very little in here to damage. And everything that is in here, well, it's kind of well protected. In the back of this, you have an opening for the battery, which we don't have anymore, but even that's surrounded on all sides by several millimeters of plastic. If we sweep through to look at those electronics, we'll find that despite being a very pretty circuit board, they're all actually hidden underneath metal RF enclosures. Now, I don't believe these are as common in modern cell phones, because I think we've just gotten better at RF design. But, look at that. Yeah, we have a metal can over every package. And that would provide some degree of resilience and also just an amount of springiness above all the sensitive circuitry. There's a considerable amount of airspace just captured in this entire design. You have your battery, and then a layer of plastic, and then a bit of air, and then a metal cage, and then a bit of air, and then your electronics. And then, on the face side of this, which usually isn't the side getting hit, you have your buttons, which go through a silicone pad, and then directly impinge on that same circuit board. So there's actually only a single board in here. Now, interconnects, connectors on the board, they're pretty fragile, because they're large mechanical parts, and they can fail, and we don't have any of those to worry about here. Now that connection to the screen is one of the parts where these are known to break. The hinge, the screen just kind of dies and falls off. So we're not going to dig too deep into that in terms of its resilience or durability. But putting your entire design onto a single board kind of 
it's just kind of amazing that all of this fits, including even the buttons on the back side here. Let me get a different view where we can actually see all the individual layers of this circuit board. Sweeping through this, we see down at the bottom here, our SIM card cover. And of course, that's another RF cover. We go through the SIM card cover, and then we're winding up in the RF cages for all the other parts. And of course, there is yet another RF cage underneath the SIM cards with just a hole here for the six pin contact that needs to touch the SIM card on the bottom. I'm thinking paranoia may have been a factor in this design. But sure enough, every other integrated circuit on this board also has an RF cage on it. Go down the sides, and now we arrive at the circuit board. And it's a pretty beautifully laid out board. I'm not going to try and guess what all these parts are, but we can just kind of take this in. Actually, I'll guess on one. That, that looks like a DRAM package, but a very nicely put together and arranged board. They made this no bigger than they absolutely had to, and it really shows in the layout of this. There's just no room left for literally anything. Let's keep digging. So if we go through this first layer, and it's all surface mount components, which was typical for that era, but that was definitely the start of the surface mount era. Yeah, in there, we start being able to see our board traces. Of course, we don't quite have the scan quality to see every individual layer of the circuit board, but we do have enough scan quality to look at the structure of the individual packages and ICs on the board, which is... Now, this isn't particularly useful. You don't learn much, but it's kind of cool to see. Because you have this package here, this package here, and this package here, which are all constructed ever so slightly differently. And as we go through, we can see the bond wires and lead frame of the package, supplies permitting. Eventually, we wind up down here in all the solder joints, and I think this may be leaded solder still. I'm not sure. Okay, so 2005, this would have been after the introduction of ROHS, so this might... I don't know whether this is leaded or lead-free solder, but still, it really stands out compared to fiberglass and silicon. As we go going through, we wind up on the other side of the circuit board, and this is where the rubber meets the road, or at least the user meets the buttons because these are the individual electrical contacts that form the button matrix on the front of the device. Let me see if I can get a clear view of this, showing the contrasting contacts. Similarly to any input device of this era, or even modern ones, this uses silicone domes underneath buttons to bridge contacts on the board themselves. And we can, of course, see those contacts on the board. Each one of these rings corresponds to a button. So those two I've circled are going to be five, and eight. Zero, pound, hang up, pick up, other one, other one, up, right, left, you get the idea. Another thing we can see from here, and I didn't realize this was a feature of this phone, is that we have six LEDs on this board in between all of the key switches. And what those are gonna do is, well, they're gonna backlight the keys, because it's kinda nice to have if you're using something like this in the dark. Pretty nifty. Altogether, those silicone dome buttons are going to form a fairly resilient input method. They might wear out, but only after like several hundred thousand cycles. And they're not really going to be that susceptible to mechanical damage, because if you squish this down all the way, all you're doing is just pushing against the circuit board, which we've already covered, pretty resilient to being squashed. The final place we have to look is at the screen. And of course, this thing actually has two screens, one on the back, one on the front here. So let's take a look at how that's been constructed. In the screen, I don't think we're going to be able to find anything super revealing, but at least it's very pretty. And what makes it pretty? Well, it's so clean. We can immediately see all of the traces in this circuit board that actually creates the screen, which I love to see. But curiously, there is one more RF protected package in here. Up in the top here, there is a couple actual active parts. Several of them form this one RF protected circuit in this box. But I don't really know what that's there for. I don't know why you'd move any of the RF equipment away from the actual handset and radio. Other than that, a package for the MEMS speaker that is actually forming an earpiece right up in there. And that is this guy right here. I don't know why speakers use that distinctive package, but that is still pretty common in this day and age for an actual surface mounted loudspeaker. It's not that loud, but still. Okay, this actually makes sense now. The reason they have a fancy electronic circuit up here is because they need to drive the display on the back of the phone as well. Because this thing has two screens in it. That screen 
is actually wired in. Oh, no, I'm about to make a fool of myself. Pardon me. Yeah, because I'm actually, I'm thinking about this backwards. This is actually like this. This is like this in the frame. We're seeing this lump here coming down here. So I'm looking at this backwards. That's fun. And this image is mirrored, so... I'm just gonna hold it out of your view. Um, yeah, the strangest thing about this is that this second display hardly shows up in the scan whatsoever. I, I can barely make it out. Um, let's try cropping in. Turn that all the way up, turn that all the way up. Okay, so from here, we start to make it out. There is not much, if any, metal inside of these old school LCDs. There isn't much in modern LCDs either, but there's barely anything in there. So that's kind of fun. And feeling this again and looking at the scans, it does kind of hint at that robustness again. There is a whole bunch of squish in here, and that's because, well, there's a whole bunch of air inside this phone. If we dial the opacity of the scan back a bit, we can start to see the underlying structures past where we've sliced. And they're still pretty subtle. It looks like the display on the front of the screen, the main display, is driven by that integrated circuit up at the top of the screen module. Meanwhile, the back display, the rear display, is driven directly via cables coming from inside of the rest of the phone in the ribbon cable. And where is that ribbon cable? Well, it's got its one connector up here, and then it sweeps around here, and fills in that sort of hinge area. So that connector gets bent and flexed every time. It probably doesn't end well, but I think they knew what they were doing. So when all's said and done, why were these things so resilient, and why can't we have that now? Well, it really comes down to it's made out of robust plastic, it has a whole bunch of air space and voids inside of it that can absorb shock and flex without damaging anything on the inside, and it's just less fragile. It's got old school parts in big metal boxes, and none of that stuff's really gonna break just because, you know, dropped it onto your desk. I don't think we can get back to this in our modern devices without sacrificing things we take for granted, like rigid glass screens instead of soft plastic ones, or thin, lightweight metal housings instead of whatever this is. But overall, it is nice to imagine a world where we could have kept the resilience and still gotten the compactness of the modern device. Although admittedly, my personal phone, not a great example of compactness. Well, thanks for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave us a like. And if you want to see inside of something, leave a comment with your suggestion. If you want to support the channel, share this video with a friend or check out hacksmith.store. And if you want to see inside of everything, get subscribed.